wasted money on a banner ad on the official GDC website in the hopes of making my work feel even more legit. <sighs> the lengths I go to in order hello, to justify hello. my insecurities. So since that <laughs> my mic is on. Like okay, there we go. I there this is going to be a little bit of an odd stream, I think. Their turn to play. And since the game was a linear experience, well, this is kind of just what I do in my free time. Play, they would ruin all the twists in the game for themselves. Hey, shut up. So I got the this is just kind of what I do in my free time. I just um, I make games, I guess. I say games. It's more like just games, singular. It's an anime game about cute girls. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. Was the entire app. You would have to run yeah, I just kind of have YouTube videos on in the background while I do this. Helps me stay sane. And that was pretty much it. I was <clears> using <throat> the phone's accelerometer to detect acceleration and calculate movement speed over a certain amount of time <coughs> in order to determine if she's truly right moving back. or not. We also experimented with pulling the GPS system for location data, but that was too slow and inaccurate for a health bar that drains in like 10 seconds. I even accounted for anti cheat Dude. methods preventing the bar from mad at allergies you take your phone now this app is no longer available on the play store but if you have an android phone and you really want to try uh. it for yourself i made the apk file available for the lowest patreon tier on patreon.com slash mental checkpoint so if you want to take it for a spin go to the link on the screen right now anyway it was really fun to see people react to the realization that they have to actually move after opening the app this also resulted in some people moving away from our booth and never coming back. Very good distraction indeed. Eventually, we ended up going to more and more events, gradually stepping up my game. At first, my booths were made up of random things I had at home, like using right, for the these garbage bags. I'm just gonna kind of draw them TV like kind of blobby like that. If I can borrow their Xbox controllers to return them significantly more greasy. Shortly after, I have upgraded to professional looks pretty good, materials, right? Yeah. Like cardboard and markers. But in the end, Move or Die was showcased across multiple continents and countries, including the US several times, UK, Germany, Austria, Pakistan, France, Romania, Ukraine, Finland, Sweden, Poland, Croatia, Argentina, Russia, Vietnam, Lithuania, Italy, Taiwan, Spain, Netherlands, and my favorite, Japan. Game is going for every Lots of places. event I've been to, I have <coughs> printed various marketing materials, from business cards to those character flyers and a bunch of other stuff. And I always either leave those at the booth for people to simply grab, or I actively spread them around in the crowd, for free, obviously, since they are marketing materials. So imagine my surprised face when I found out that someone was trying to sell our free promotional materials on eBay, and the guy was also asking for 30 30 whole doll redos. I was actually considering buying them, but I didn't. Oh, and speaking of marketing materials, while I was designing and printing banners for events, out of boredom, uh. I developed the habit of hiding tiny rocket ships in the artwork of those banners. And All right, fellas, have you, have you taken your allergy meds things, yet? I got mixed reactions when I <laughs> I, I barely friends. did. So this is the perfect time to settle this in the comments below. Is this something you would do as well, or am I the crazy one? Because even though I'm almost 30 now, I still think this is funny, and I might still be actively doing it in these videos, so let me know. Another little marketing trick that I was very proud of was figuring out how to capture the player's reactions at events. I was aware that when you develop a party game, a big part of the fun happens outside the game, where players laugh and taunt each other, and I noticed that almost no other game made any efforts to represent that in their marketing efforts. So at one event, I decided to mount a webcam on top of the big screen pointed at the players and run XSplit in the background, because I haven't learned about OBS yet, capturing a constant feed during the entire event. The problem with this was that in the end, you have to sift through literal days worth of footage to find the good parts. And for a lazy person like me, that's just not gonna happen. So again, smart me, for seeing this problem, I have also plugged in a high quality microphone somewhere under the booth, recording the player's reactions. And by knowing that crowds tend to be loud when something interesting happens, all I had to do was check the 
audio picks in my video file, making the act of filtering out the good bits much, much easier. That's how I ended up with this montage in the game's release trailer, which I think contributed a lot to the game's success. I'm planning for this to be a series of multiple videos covering those obscure stories about Move or Die's development. So if you want to hear about that time a Chinese company wanted to buy the Move or Die IP in order to make it into a loading screen for their FPS game, make sure to stay subscribed. I have a <laughs> lot of weird stories to tell. But until next time... Well, wait, what did he just say about a Chinese company wanting to turn a, an entire game into an F to a loading screen? So in Castle Crash, okay, that's pretty wacky. That's village, that's pretty wacky. Tall grass fields and storm an Super wacky. Castle. You arrive at the obligatory desert level and you stumble upon wow. a new tool, a shovel, and you can now dig anywhere you want. A few seconds later, you notice a little X mark on the ground. So naturally, you go over it and start digging. And this time, you're rewarded with an item. That is pretty cool. But what is mind blowing is that in that moment, you realize that you've seen those X marks before. And now you're wondering what kind of goodies were buried under your nose this entire time. So it's time to go back to those levels and experience something I call recontextualization. This video was sponsored by World of Warships, yeah. the strategic team-based sea battle game available for PC. There are 44 million players controlling 400 historical ships over 40 different maps in this game, which is pretty much the go-to game if you're into anything related to battleships, aircraft carriers, or cruisers. And the developers are apparently releasing new content every single month. Oh, also, when it this comes guy to says apparently in his sponsored message. Division with your friends by getting the game through the link in the description. And you know how these things go. If Doesn't this uh, bag look kind of you get a bunch of free goodies like 200 doubloons plus 1 million credits as well as the premium battleship USS Texas yeah yeah it, lo it looks and a looks a little phallic status. I'm not gonna so lie thank you very much world of warships for looks a little phallic this video go show your appreciation by downloading the game all right the time to officialize it now back to our video Years after we finish a game, we only remember certain highlights from that gameplay experience. Like catching the boat in Prince of Persia, your first knife kill in this game, and how bullshit that race was in Mafia 1. Those weren't necessarily good memories. However, when the context changes in a game and it allows you to experience a previous section from a new perspective, that's pretty much guaranteed to be remembered. Nine. Okay, as so a this is the nine you learn a piece of garbage bag that sprites. Go, that is. That should be that plenty. This whole time at that moment it feels like the game opens up and your curiosity is ignited which is a very powerful moment we associate with what we call good games however pulling that off in your game is not exactly easy so let me try to define this thing i call recontextualization it's the immediate introduction of a mechanic or piece of information that enables the player to experience already existing content in a new way. In other this is, words, this is kind of how I remember the garbage cans in my school. Content, and that is an important part. It has to be content that was already there. So sprinkling new enemies in an old area does not count. Yeah. I mean, sure, it brings some value to that area, but it doesn't have the same emotional impact as recontextualization done properly. And in my process of researching this neat little design trick, I noticed that it comes in two flavors. So let's take a look at some right, actual game that. examples in order to get a better idea of how this works. The mechanical type of Let's recontextualization implies that the player can only experience it once the game allows them to. This usually takes the form of unlocking an ability or receiving an item that allows the player to interact with previous content in a new way. Basically, it's a mechanical switch no, okay. that the designer decides when to flip. 
At its core, it's the kind of design philosophy behind most Matroidvania games. You stumble upon an item that grants you an ability you can use to overcome an obstacle somewhere else in the game. A better example of this is the shovel from Castle Crashers mentioned earlier. At the point when you unlock the shovel, you're already roughly halfway through the entire game. And at that point, you've seen almost a dozen X's on the ground in previous levels. So in this case, the implementation works flawlessly because the game allows you to move between levels whenever you want, encouraging you to act upon that curiosity of yours. Another interesting approach to changing context mechanically is character yeah. creation. Yeah. Different characters with different abilities would allow you to approach content differently. Let's say, for example, there's a game in which you can invest points in various skill trees, go all out on hostile abilities, and you can take down any group of enemies. However, if you invest those points in strength, you can move this heavy vending machine to reveal a vent that allows you to bypass that group of enemies in the exact same level. Same content approached in a different context. It's a bit... Adam! Adam, what's happening? Now. What's your situation? Adam! It seems that a lot of games use this design tool to mess with navigation. Getting a new disguise outfit in Hitman allows you to navigate previously hostile areas. Or in Dead Cells, you'll find these green blobs around that you can tickle. And after you play some more, you'll stumble upon a rune that allows you to transform those green blobs into vines. You can now climb into areas that were previously unreachable. And while these mechanical examples are great, there is that second flavor I mentioned that I think is even better. That's the skybox. The knowledge type of recontextualization is the kind that happens directly in the player's mind. And because of that, I think this has an even bigger emotional impact on the experience. It's also significantly more difficult to design as a result of that. Where before you had to wait for the game to mechanically unlock something for you, now you don't have to wait at all. It's something the player can do at any time as long as they know they can. It's all about the knowledge in your brain and what you know. So take Tokitori 2 for example. In this lovely puzzle game, you have to manipulate the creatures around you in order to navigate the levels and solve puzzles. And you do that with your abilities that you already have available from the very beginning of the game. You don't need to unlock any skills. So as you start the first level, you go to the right and you use your stomp ability to break this platform. Shortly after, you learn that you can feed these little purple creatures to the blue frog. And if you stomp next to it, it's going to burn a bubble that carries you upwards. Oh, and your other ability is a little chirp that can move platforms and lure birds to your location. So now, with the knowledge of how to interact with these creatures, you start the game again. However, this time, instead of breaking that platform, you realize that there's a bird there that you can lure over by chirping. So you try that, and it picks up this purple creature that was conveniently placed there, and now you can feed it to the frog. So with one more stomp, you have just discovered a completely new area. This is the beauty of knowledge-based recontextualization. Those rules and creatures, the content was always there this entire time, but you simply lacked the knowledge of interacting with them in this new way. In Hollow Knight, you run into this spike gap that's so big it's seemingly impossible to jump over, unless you know that you can pogo off of spikes by swinging your sword downwards. And as a result, you're treated with a little reward. As soon as you learn that, you start asking yourself if there are any other spike gaps that you could pogo over anywhere else in the game. And that thought right there makes any game feel way bigger than it actually is. However, it's very difficult to fully commit your game's core design to this concept, and as a result, there are extremely few games that truly embrace knowledge-based recontextualization. The Witness being one of the very few games where you start off by solving line-based puzzles, and as you progress, they become gradually more difficult. But also, after you're exposed to them for a while, you'll slowly start noticing them within the environment itself all around you. And that is a great example 
example of this design choice being used to reinforce the core idea of the game itself, both mechanically but also thematically. Another equally rare example I can think of is Outer Wilds, where this concept is integrated so deeply into the game's design that I cannot even talk about it without spoiling parts of it. I am working on a separate video on how Outer Wilds did that exactly by having a chat with its designer to get a better perspective on it, so make sure to stay subscribed for that. But regardless if you prefer the mechanical or the knowledge type, we should talk about some worries when it comes to adding these concepts into your game. The obvious measurable benefit of this design concept is the ability to breathe in new life into already consumed content. And obviously, this seems to work for a certain type of non-linear games. It seems that one requirement for this to work is the player's ability to go back to previous levels, be it through a level selection screen or through more seamless ways. And as a designer myself, I understand the reluctance you might have against this. I mean, if the players could break a sequence by executing some specific actions, that means that unaware players might stumble upon that by mistake. And yeah, that's true, but statistically, that's not something you should worry about, because even if that happens, I wouldn't exactly call it a negative experience. Oh, I should not be here. I should not be here. My ship is 33 kilometers away now. What the fuck? If you don't want to fully commit to this design philosophy within your game, then you can implement a lightweight version of recontextualization, which is the popular practice of adding small hidden rooms in your levels with little rewards in them. You know, the wall chicken in Castlevania if you know where to attack, or the little hidden spots in Loco Roco that are usually nicely telegraphed through the level design. It's also the moment in Gone Home when you find out that there are secret panels hidden in the house walls. Same thing goes for illusionary walls in Souls games, except the ones that take 50 hits to discover, because those ones. You also don't have <laughs> I to hate those stick ones. to mechanical or knowledge-based recontextualization, but instead you can embrace both like Valheim did, which also happens to be my favorite example of this concept. In the game, you usually start off in the meadows, and as you make progress, you work your way through other biomes like forest, mountains, swamp, and so on. Usually, games that use this progression path don't really give you a reason to go back to a previous biome after you've moved away from it effectively making it into dead content. However, in Valheim, you stumble upon an item called the Wishbone later in the game. And when you equip this item, your character starts pulsing oh, whenever you're about? close to a secret. And it turns out there are secrets buried in the ground everywhere. And they are different based on each biome, oh. giving you a reason to go back and experience old content from a new perspective. I actually did this not know that about Valheim. Because it's both a mechanical switch by unlocking the item, but also a knowledge one if you know what to look for. You That's can find those secrets by paying attention to subtle hints and landmarks without really needing the item to begin with. So I think this is a super powerful design practice that adds a lot of value to previously explored content. And no, if you've like experienced this one. before in a game, please let me know how that went down in the comments, since I'm always on the lookout to gather more examples. Oh, and in the spirit of having a little fun with this concept, if you take every game shown on screen when I said the word recontextualization in this video, and you fill in the first letter of those game names in this link, you'll get access to my personal best burger recipe so good luck <laughs> burger recipe So we know that mobile games are bad, right? Yes. But I had no idea just how poisonous some of them are. And that's because I've been secretly talking with developers from big companies and I was told exactly how these games exploit the player's psychology to get them to spend money. And I promise, you will be surprised to find out who popularized some of these predatory tactics. So let's talk about what makes mobile games so toxic. The 
this video will be a constant spiral of oh it gets worse. For example, you know those mobile ads you see everywhere? Well, I hate it them. it turns out the games they advertise don't actually exist. Get this, it's apparently a common practice for companies to A-B test ads for fake vaporware games and whichever ad gets more attention, they start making that game. For the longest time, I've stayed away from mobile games because I had this gut feeling that they are not made to be inherently good games, but instead their design is driven by profits. It turns out, most mobile games are filled with unethical ways of getting players to spend money, and for the past few weeks I've been talking with developers from some big companies and I was told how the morally questionable sausage is made. Now, for obvious reasons, those developers will remain anonymous, but you know who you are and I thank you for exposing these secrets I'm going to talk about. And also, the games shown on screen are not necessarily related to the topics I discuss. So in the hopes of making players aware of these tricks and help you avoid them as well, I'm going to shine a light on these predatory schemes and the companies behind them. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, the well-known role-playing game focused on epic PvP battles. Wait, is and it? Let me tell you about the Doom. What the hell? The evil secrets behind free-to-play games, and the sponsor is Raid Shadow Legends. Hold on. Wait. Wait. Wait a second. Wait a second here. Wait just a second. I, I need to. I need to see the comments for this. <laughs> the mobile games industry is inherently toxic and just wants you to give them your money. This message is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Ironic. <laughs> oh my now, gosh. This is basically a giant prison full of evil monsters that is slowly failing. <laughs> so now it's up to us to go in there and knock some heads before they get out. You're going to need some seriously powerful. This guy's actually insane! Debuffs, since the Doom Tower bosses ignore block debuffs. I personally love the PvP arena. He's a menace! How addictive the game is as you slay monsters. And because you're watching this. A total video, you can menace! Start off oh on the right my foot by goodness the gracious. Right now. And if you use the link Ooh, in the description or scan the QR code shed. on the screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. Like, for example, the free Epic Champion. Rector Drath, alongside 20 hundred thousand silver, one energy refill, and one XP boost. And on top of all of that, you'll also get one ancient oh, shard, sick. so you can summon idea. awesome champions as soon as you start playing. All of these treasures will be waiting for you right here, but act fast because all of. Shut up. <laughs> Need to do something real quick. these will only be available for okay. the next 30 days and only for new players and you don't want to miss out on these so and check this the section link in the description kinda, or scan the QR code and get raid shadow legends right now yeah raid <laughs> about that so Normally, I try Rage to cover Shadow topics Legends. in a fairly objective way, but this video will be a bit more personal, as I have some strong feelings about this topic. I grew up with PC games, and naturally, I started developing PC games as well, and even though they were the standard, I always hated microtransactions with a passion. 
to the point where there's a clear anti-microtransactions message in my own game, Move or Die, I also made sure that there is no way to spend real world money to buy anything from my game. That's the I'm doing my part section of this video. It probably doesn't make a difference in the grand scheme of things, but eh, what the hell. I guess I missed the days when games were good. Back when you saw someone rocking sweet gear, you knew that meant that they were a force to reckon with. They either spent a lot of time grinding yeah. for it or they took down an epic boss. It exactly. was a symbol of skill. Nowadays, you have to buy nail polish in order to unlock a specific color armor. So when you see someone with a fancy Final skin, Fantasy 14, uh, you have the so super cool raid rewards, uh, which are pretty cool. Red, there's crack shot um the industry got greedy and things got bad. We went from horse armor and microtransactions in fully priced single player games to literally not being able to afford playing a free to play game. Try wrapping your head around that sentence. I'm on team PC and it's sad to see these trends seep into PC games as well, but it's so much worse in the mobile world. If you take all the money generated by all PC games and you add on top of that all revenue generated by consoles, that is Nintendo, Sony and Microsoft combined, they make less money than the mobile game industry. And they got there by making ethical design choices and being honest with their players, is probably what they tell their employees. Look, there's this popular talk on how to get your mobile players to spend money and it's called Let's Go Whaling. And if you thought that the title was in poor taste, just let me show you how the talk actually starts. Some of you will probably uh, be slightly shocked by w all the tricks I have listed here, but I'll leave the morality of it out of the talk. We can discuss it uh, if we have time later. He did not talk about it later. So mobile games Ouch. got so big by being deceiving on purpose and using predatory tactics in games that are designed to be very approachable like free to play and hyper casual games. These are specifically aimed at players that are unaware of those predatory tactics and the companies behind those games abuse psychological tricks to separate those players from their wallets. Alright, the silhouette of this side of the wall looks it turns pretty out bad. A lot of those players are retired I'm senior going to go citizens or it. people with gambling addictions that are already in debt, spending money that they don't really have. And boy, are those games good at squeezing money out of those players. And I know yep. you're thinking it's fine. I don't fall for those tricks, and I've never spent. I any personally money in a don't fall for those before. tricks unless and I do. I thought the same thing, but it turns out even if you don't spend money in those games, you're still contributing to the predatory system without even realizing it. Oh, but no. in order to explain that, I'll have to tell you about what's going on inside the companies responsible for those games. So remember those ads that decide which game gets to be made? Well, it turns out that profit-based mentality is seen throughout the development process of the most successful mobile games. Basically, you do what's okay, most profitable, and design decisions are actively motivated by maximizing profits. I was told by one of the developers that a lot of players requested the ability to reset their skills. However, they voted against it internally simply because it made no difference on the game profits. This mentality is also present in the actual composition of the development teams, where in PC and console game dev teams, for example, the focus is on actual development, so a majority of team members work in creative disciplines like art, programming, writing, and design. While on the other hand, in the mobile world, development teams lean way more on live ops, community managers, and overall disciplines that relate to user acquisition rather than creative work. Mm. There are also psychologists contractors and data scientists present in teams in order to interpret player behavior and drive the design choices based on numbers and statistics handed five star all right, so I kind of want this section to have a kind of a red. Mentions that there are four kind of types red. of game progression: skill, luck, grind, and pay. I'm going and to I quote: "Make sure that your games aren't too skill-based." I made that mistake myself. You don't get people to pay you because there's no reason to.
So the most popular mobile games out there focus on the grinding and paying types of progression design. Internally, companies call this pay to compete and it's deeply integrated within the gameplay itself. There is this concept in game design called a gameplay loop, which is in broad strokes what you do in a game. For example, a gameplay loop can be focused on explore, combat and upgrade. Some gameplay loops are really short okay, and some of them can get brown kind of If you want to make a profitable mobile game, kind of contrasts store, with the background or part of the gameplay loop. That's how you end up with the so-called whale players spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in yeah. those games. Oh, and that I was told okay. that internally the term whale is kind of frowned upon and instead more sensible alternatives are used like big spender or VIP. And you've They're probably whales. heard about the concept of whales in mobile games before and you didn't think much of it because obviously you're not one of those whale players. You're better, you don't spend money in those games. But have you ever heard about the saying that you either pay for a product or you are the product? Here's the thing, as a free player, you are the content for those whales. Games are designed to monetize bullying, constantly pushing for that power trip and forcing players to attack each other, only to encourage them to spend even more money in game, be ah. it to gear up for a fight <laughs> PvP. or damage control after one. Oh, and if it wasn't bad enough, I was told that it is standard practice in the industry to give preferential treatment to those VIP players. For example, a lot of companies have a zero tolerance policy, so if a player harasses someone else in the in-game chat, they get insta-banned. However, I heard many anecdotes about support tickets from VIP players being prioritized and whenever they broke the rules, which sometimes involved death threats towards other players, they simply got off with a slap on the wrist because banning them would be a direct hit to the company's profits. But how players Ouch. end up spending so much money is a more involved journey with a bunch of dirty tricks. So let me tell you how these mm. games exploit mm. your attention. I think that patio looks a little good. The right, initial purpose cool. of a mobile game is to hook you, to get your attention and to keep it for long enough that playing the game there becomes go, a habit okay, with the end okay. goal of it turning into a hobby. Naturally, every sane player goes in with the mentality of I will never pay for a mobile game. And that is very good. It's also the exact mentality that designers are trying to break. And the secret to doing that is keeping players playing for as long as possible. Engagement is sometimes valued above monetization because everyone breaks eventually. So games employ sneaky little tricks to take advantage of your curiosity. For example, if you haven't opened the game for a few hours, you'll get a notification that says, congratulations, Ding. you got a gift. Now, the secret sauce is strategically withholding information. Notice how it simply says a gift without mentioning what it is actually, and that is done on purpose. There's this theory that we have two types of thinking. A system one, also known as fast thinking, which is automatic, like recognizing objects and making fast decisions based on intuition. Okay, and so a system a two, building. also known as slow thinking. This yeah, is built, where rationality that, comes into ground play, layer. where your brain needs okay. time to analyze yes, something and good. make a calculated decision. That ain't good. Now, can you guess which one? It's system one. Mobile games are all about the fast thinking system and are focused on immediate gratification without making the players think too much because we don't want any rationality when it comes to financial decisions, right? If they're not going to give me book of books, then I'm going to buy my own book of cards. So I have all the book of books. And similarly to exploiting your attention, these games also exploit their own content. Spending time to craft new content for an update that delivers a memorable experience would be the right thing to do. But making so content is, is expensive. It takes time and money, building. so companies find creative workarounds. If you thought that different colored enemies was lazy, let me introduce you to mobile game content. Levels, items, and skins are basically on a loop, being recycled every 12 weeks throughout various timed seasonal events. 
and pretty much every month so more can powerful wall items jump are added off to the of game these. without worrying too much about power creep. After all, an overpowered item is more exciting to pay for than one that's properly balanced. And when a piece of content like a skin performs really well, it is analyzed to death in the hopes of replicating its success and milk it as much as possible. The name of the game is making sure that players can spend at least $1000 on in-app purchases. And even that is considered to be the bare minimum in the industry, with some games aiming for no spending limits by designing the game in such a way that hmm. there is no oh, how can I texture end. this? You're encouraged to keep spending money on consumables like potions and timed boosts until you burn out. And the sad thing is that these tricks go beyond just abusing your curiosity and attention. So when it comes to convincing you to start spending money, this is how they get you. You getcha already with know gotcha. about loot boxes, since they have been all over games for the past few years. They have a good presence in mobile games, but they have also been used in PC and console games for a while now. Can you guess who popularized the whole loot box mechanic? Valve. Valve of all companies in a 2010 patch for Team Fortress 2 where the crate and key system was introduced. There were even international Thank you, Valve. debates on loot Unintentionally boxes ruining and, boots, gaming. and as a result legislation was created forcing developers to make the item drop percentage odds public. I was told that initially complying with this legislation caused a little bit of worry internally but companies realized shortly after that there was no noticeable change in players spending habits even with the odds being public uh, guns out. oh oh <laughs> Stat -trek! Stat -trek! going even further games will be designed to constantly expose you to the idea of getting rare items i don't really so know how to texture this building from your guild receives a rare item a message like it's just supposed to be like a up on your like, i don't know like, like a know concrete wall but red got lucky this in turn reinforces the idea like, that you do get lucky and throughout overexposure convince you to spend money for that one lucky roll and the chance of getting a legendary item tends to be very, very small. We're talking somewhere in the ballpark of like 0.001%. These are called chase items and they keep players chasing them and constantly spend money while only being rewarded with common low tier items. However, psychology studies reveal that players will only put up with that for so long, so games have built in systems to estimate when you're about to give up. They know how many loot boxes you've opened and exactly what items you've got and if you do that repeatedly, after a certain number of common items, the game will intentionally reward you with a slightly rarer item in order to keep your hopes up and keep you spending. Oh yes, 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 that's a good one. Desert Eagle Print Stream. Oh, minimal way with good flow. That's very nice. Wait, how much is this one? I think it's like 80 euros or something. Now, when it comes to actually spending money, most games have mm. different custom in-game currencies. Gems, coins, crystals, whatever thematic fitting currency with the purpose of creating a disconnection between the number on your screen and your real world money. The whole idea is to make players feel like they're not really spending money. And these custom currencies they are. can only be oh, purchased yeah, they in are. predetermined amounts which are very specifically fine-tuned to ensure that after you're done shopping, you will always have a little bit of leftover currency. So let's say you want this fortune chest that costs 750 gems. Of course, there is no option to purchase exactly 750 gems, so the closest to that amount is this bundle of 1200 gems. Alright, you take your wallet out and with those gems you buy your chest. You now have 450 gems to spare. Sweet, you get an emote and now you're left with 200 gems. There is nothing in this store you can buy for 200 gems. You only need 50 more to get something. But what's that? The smallest amount of gems you can buy is 80. This is very intentional and you'll always found yourself in a position where you're just shy of being able to afford something premium currency. And if you're resistant to purchasing something in the first place, oh boy they have a solution for that as well. 
You know how when there is a discount on a game, you can tell your friend to get that game because it is common knowledge that these discounts are the same for everyone? Well, not in mobile games. If you are a free player who has yet to spend any money in the game, you will get custom discounts tailored for you in order to persuade you to open up your wallet. These discounts are presented as limited time offers that get cheaper and cheaper over time. Doesn't matter how low they have to go, even if it's a few cents, because as soon as you start spending money, they have you going down that slippery slope. A live op dev told me that they have a huge amount of fine controls to personalize these player based discounts to show up exactly in the moments of time when players are more likely to start spending. Be it when they finish the tutorial or if they are I don't really know what, week, or if they just <laughs> what texture PDP this uh, building is supposed move. to be anymore. There are even services it's there like vaguely rock like what, what do they just to build? They just serve up these discounts to players at the most just profitable moment in time. And the worrying thing about all of this is that they build into psychological the psychological tricks in the context of social interactions. Right. First of all, most of the predatory tactics I've mentioned so far take advantage of players' fear of missing out. We oh. are social creatures and naturally we want to be part of things and feel like we belong. And right. that is a reoccurring pull out weakness the symmetry that these tool. games abuse constantly. All of these discounts are on a limited timer on purpose. They tell you to act now because the offer will expire soon and you definitely don't want to miss out on this one. We see this in our everyday lives, including PC and console games where the currently most popular form of this exploit was born, the Battle Pass. A linear timeline of items that you gradually unlock as you play the game. Now, can you tell me who was the first developer to popularize Valve? It was Valve again with Dota 2 in 2013. The thing is, that fear of missing out concept is amplified even further by sprinkling some free unlocks on that battle pass timeline while keeping all the good stuff locked behind a paywall. This way, as you play the game and level up, you will see your Valve, progress you were the chosen the one. And you'll get a Where's Half-Life 3, huh, Valve? The game has the power to Give us Counter-Strike 2, but about Half-Life 3? Premium items you can unlock right now if you pay just $9 for the battle pass you worked We're so hard three. to level up to this point it would be a shame if the battle pass season passes and you miss out on all of these awesome premium items you've already put in the work what is nine more dollars right nine more dollars disguised in our in-game currency that will leave you with leftovers but let's not mention that so this is known as loss aversion, and it's the concept of giving the players something Great. and threaten them that you'll take it away if they don't pay. This works because people get attached to the idea of owning something, so they're more likely to pay to prevent the loss of ownership than they would be to gain something to begin with. Some games will show you premium currency you gain in your bank by simply playing the game, but in order to gain access to that bank and be able to use it, you guessed it, you gotta pay. Other games reward you with loyalty points the more you spend, but in order to maintain those points, you must spend a minimum amount each month. Same toxic trick, but in a different packaging. Lots of... I can see why this, why this is rewarding, when I just click things and it looks really cool, and I go and get stuff, so like, alright, cool. And the final nail in the coffin is that all of this is leveraging the power of social interactions. As I mentioned before, we're social creatures and the companies behind these games are well aware of that. So minutes within starting a new game, you will be asked to join a guild. Here's a list of guilds looking for members, team up with other players or invite over some friends to play with. Mm. There is a big focus on putting social pressure on players and get them to form real friendships with other players because that's what's going to keep them playing and spending more. Social pressure is a great way to maintain engagement, and the horrible thing is that people actually make real friends in those games. I was told stories of real life players meetups or anecdotes of players getting married after they've met in game, but these relationships are forged in the context of a toxic platform. I was actually shocked when one of the developers I've talked to told me about a message they've got from one of the players asking them if they can lower the cost of a new feature because they simply can't afford to pay for it and their rent given that they were on a pension. 
we all know how difficult it is to move on to a new game when all of our friends are still playing the old one. So if you already have a gambling addiction and your social interactions with other friends happen throughout the in-game chat yeah, I think of this a looks predatory good. game, you're simply stuck in an echo chamber where your bad tendencies are simply amplified. There's a big ass the door. Also use the labeling technique, which is the idea that people are more likely to behave how they are told to. So if the game tells a player that they are generous and good at supporting the developers, they are presumably more likely to spend money in those games. But by the way, thank you so much for already being subscribed to this channel. You have a great taste in game design YouTubers. I really appreciate it. So while these practices are not set in stone, it's a good idea to keep an eye out for them and be aware when you notice them in a game. It doesn't mean that a game is automatically out to get you if they use any of these practices. Hell, even I'm guilty of dipping into similar design decisions in the past. The question now is what can we do as players to discourage these tactics and change the way this industry is? As I mentioned before, playing these games while not spending money is not good enough because you're the content for the paying players. So it's gonna sound super cheesy, but in this case the best thing to do is to genuinely share this video with other people so they become aware of these tactics and maybe the second best thing to do is to actually support those genuinely good mobile games out there that are not toxic. The games that were developed with the purpose of creating a memorable experience instead of squeezing your wallet dry. And those good games are not easy to find because they're not the big money makers. So let's change that. Let's fill up the comment section with examples of those games that deserve our attention. If you know one, drop definitely. it down below. The mobile games I know definitely do not deserve that praise. I play one of them. I play one of them too. You know when a game is announced at an event and they show a gameplay trailer, have you noticed that it doesn't really look like normal gameplay? It's oddly smooth and seemingly planned, like the person behind the controller is an actor, performing for the trailer instead of simply playing the game like a normal person would. And that's true. Usually there is someone behind the scenes with a controller showcasing the ideal way to play the game, their way of how the game should be played. But once you get your hands on the game, your gameplay looks completely different. And I'd make the point that that difference in playstyles is God. actually the game's fault. The designer has it's having to be player. an architect. So let's talk about why being forced. Have to be an architect, a, a city like planner, is school planner. That's to get the right like look and aesthetic for the for the area. It's it's rough. Pretty rough. I'm aware that this video will rely a lot on Doom examples, but I'll try my best to sneak in other games as well. So okay, what, what is this uh, layer for? Uh, this is the door. The truth is, when we showed it, it could make a roof. That was me playing. It was all a lie, basically. Mm -hmm. I was playing in a way that was like meant to make it look cool, and I was weapon switching and doing all these things. Mm -hmm. But the whole time, I was the game needs to make you play this way. That's Hugo Martin, the director of the game, and he makes this interesting point. What we kind of noticed was that if you were a skilled FPS player and you picked up Doom 2016, you naturally fell into what we call at the studio like the fun zone, mm -hmm. where you're weapon switching and moving and glory killing and managing resources. You're doing all these good things and it feels good. The problem is most games are afraid of embracing that fun zone. For a while now, the selling buzzword for upcoming games has been freedom. Every experience is unique. No two runs are the same. But when you're faced with a problem of dealing with an enemy and you're given a lot of ways of doing that, it simply translates into most of those ways being outright boring. There you go, buddy. Tony Hawk's okay. Pro Skater wouldn't be fun if you'd Ollie constantly Now I'm thinking of the like a spiraling. Wouldn't be engaging if you'd cheese your way a to spiral. At me. That's it kind of looks like four, this. But more on that later in the video. They're playing chess. They want chess. They want something that has depth. It could come in systems. It could come in progression. It could be a super huge nuanced story. Ooh, yeah. I think Doom, this looks pretty be, nice. You know, 
The idea of the fun zone is to inject depth and meaningful micro decisions. Now remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. I just need a rough outline. That head and click. Doom Eternal constantly challenges the player. Yeah, it's like a little corkscrew. Targeting, prioritizing, resource management, weapon selection, and follow-up action to name a few. By the way, you know, if I need to, I can hire an artist to do this. You know the the engagement loop or the fun zone as we end it, which is hilarious that that is caught on. I know I said that in interviews. When I said that internally, I just couldn't think of anything else to say. It makes you think how many YouTubers come up with terms out of their ass. So as the designer, it all comes down to the balance between encouraging the player's behavior versus enforcing a specific playstyle. For example, Bloodborne encourages more aggressive playstyles by healing you if you attack an enemy within a small time frame right after they hit you. Or the double resource system in Walson, where you have it, it looks, basically one looks kind of funky. It's kind of so funky using right now. That drain one of the bars makes the other one refill, creating a balance between. I never said I was a background artist. On the other end of the spectrum, closer to enforcing Alex. play cells, you have Transistor, where your abilities get permanently deleted when you die, forcing you to change your approach. Or Assault on Android Cactus, where your battery is constantly draining and you must pick up refills from dead enemies in order to stay alive. Hmm. Doom Eternal falls somewhere closer to the enforcing side of the spectrum, with harsher punishments, preventing the player from progressing if they don't play the intended way. We keep the player inside that front zone by, to be blunt, just frustrating them. For example, in order to motivate weapon switching, certain enemies can be taken down with a single shot from a specific weapon, but the game does give you alternatives. They are pretty much brute forcing your way to the solution with more bullets, and which is significantly I slower and more tedious, but the alternative is there. Over. It's basically a trade between giving the player more freedom at the cost of a better gameplay experience. And this is where that fine line stands. That's what it looks like. Okay, now we're, now we're cooking, now we're cooking. This looks like something because enforcing the wrong kind of looks like something yeah could be disastrous dude do you, do you guys ever get like a get a little nasty hangnail like just a piece of skin just peeling off your finger this is a weird tangent but bear with me then when you touch it it hurts real bad yeah that's me right now slam dunks were the main way of scoring points which didn't make for a very interesting game to watch in the very beginning there wasn't even any dribbling imagine spectating a game like that so the basketball association had to come up with a good way to make the game more engaging to spectate the first thought that came to mind was to remove something to ban slam dunks which didn't really go that well and after some more thought and dumb ideas like including yeah. bear wrestling to spice up the halftime show the decision was made to add a new rule the three-point shot this was a high risk high reward type of move which acted as a positive reinforcement instead of the negative ban approach it looked impressive to spectators, but even better, it was preferred by the players, which made it a staple. Okay, so this is going to be like a gem. Today. That story yeah. is very similar to the well-known World of Warcraft rest system. I won't go into the details of it, but the conclusion was that removing something bad, adding positive reinforcement, good. So that's all nice and dandy, but what are the actual constraints that sit between encouragement and enforcement? There is a popular quote that shows up in every game design video essay. Given the opportunity, players will optimize the fun out of a game. Like upgrading your that strength a, in Deus Ex like so you gem. can carry a turret around, pulverizing enemies in the process while being shielded from their bullets. Or another example would be noob tubing in Modern Warfare. Uh, is that too outdated for a reference? Am I like alienating my audience? Uh, shit. Um, Halo Infinite. Uh, Elden Ring. Fortnite? Is that is that better? We good? Okay. 
So that quote came from Soren Johnson, the co-designer on some of the Civilization games, and the other designer, Sid Meier, added that one of the responsibilities of designers is to protect the players from themselves. In Bullets Per Minute, a game all about rhythm, your actions like shooting, reloading and dodging must be synchronized with the beat, otherwise you're punished by your score multiplier resetting. And I think the severity of the punishment is what determines where your design falls on this spectrum. In Move or Die, I have created the you have to move or you die mechanic to encourage a fast paced and dynamic playstyle. And even though it's in the name of the game, the punishment for ignoring that rule isn't really that severe. Where the heck is the it? Modes change so fast. Okay, so what? End up dying because oh, you didn't it's up move, here. You're removed from the game for only a handful of seconds. So I would argue that that's more of an encouragement rather than enforcement. Maybe I should redesign that mechanic. You should stay subscribed to watch me destroy my so... own game if I ever get around to do that. No! No! <laughs> Chair broke <laughs> off. <laughs> really? I'm not even now, what exactly do you have to do in order to get your game anywhere on this spectrum? Well, first, you have to identify what actions your players can do in your game, like movement, weapons choice, or resource management. After that, you have to ask yourself what decisions those players have to take into account before performing those actions. For example, when it comes to positioning, most games that have explosive enemies encourage you to keep your distance. In Doom 2016, your chainsaw melee attack is used to refill mm. ammo, so it does the exact opposite on purpose, making your position relative to the enemies an important factor in the middle of a fight. Another cool example I like is from Ultra Kill, where the game greets you with the words mankind is dead, blood is fuel, hell is full. And you quickly realize that all the blood gushing out of enemies can be used to regenerate your health. Oh, also it's published by New Blood. Very relevant. So if positioning is concerned with where you are, movement would be the focus of how you get there. In Doom Eternal, the meat hook was introduced, yet another grappling hook we've seen in many games before. But uh, it was yep. implemented okay, in the end. Like the conversation around the I don't like how um you know, squarey the enemy towards you, but not in Doom. Doom square you like move towards the, the enemy and you have the physics to allow yourself to throw yourself up in the building air to the is. side. That just emphasizes one of the core pillars what of the fun if? zone of Doom Eternal, which is movement. I guess. Fall, get to the Orange Door, and Ghost Runner are all good examples of games that put a lot a of trap thought into their player movement. But it kind of looks like a kind of looks like now, a gem when too. When it comes to weapon switching, as the designer, you have to make sure that every weapon in your game serves a purpose. In Doom 2016, you start off with a pistol because it's the unwritten law of game design tropes. And shortly after you get your first real weapon, you never have an actual need for that pistol anymore. So if you want your players to think critically about weapon switching, try to avoid situations where the player simply finds an objectively better weapon, removing any reason to go back to any of the previous weapons. The box is awaiting your attention! Lady Luck. Doom Eternal deals with this by designing each enemy to have a weak point that is exploitable with a specific weapon, pushing the player to constantly make micro decisions about switching their weapons on the go. Even the small creeps that pose no threat have right, a purpose, going acting to put as this ammo and like... overall resource refills. That aspect was also tweaked in one of the later expansion packs, but you get the Column. point. They also prioritized the fun zone type of gameplay at the cost of gradual tutorialization showing players exactly how to take advantage of those weak spots through a pretty invasive pop-up, which is something I talked about in this video. So I'm going to contradict my past self. It, it, it looks like shit, but <laughs> enforcing a better playstyle. We can ignore that. Are uh, let's just ignore please that for now. This. So those player actions we've covered are pretty much a direct way to influence playstyles in the encourage and enforce spectrum. But uh, what about pushing players towards the fun zone with other complementary systems? Alright, that looks slightly better. I 
mentioned combo systems before. These would be one of the ways of using a time-based system in order to motivate a certain playstyle. Fighting games pretty much invented and popularized the idea of combos, which can be described as a series of chained attacks within a time frame. These are designed to reward skilled players by giving them an advantage in the form of higher damage dealt to the opponent. Right. And these time-based systems can also be used. I think this looks kind of cool. Right? For example, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Little, used combos in bit. order to motivate players to use a variety of tricks, rewarding them with a higher score. And on top of that, there is also an invisible system hmm. that lowers your score gradually every time you repeat the same trick over and over again to prevent exploits. So that push towards variety not only rewards you mechanically with a higher score. This is a building, right? It needs windows. Window. Yes. Now compare that playstyle with this way of cheesing your way to a high score in one of the more recent entries in the series. A counterexample of a time-based mechanic would be the auto health regeneration in Call of Duty. Previous games would require you to Ninja. pick up health packs in order to heal, and the decision was made to push the game towards a more dynamic playstyle by regenerating the player's health over time when they are outside of combat. Counterintuitively, this encouraged a playstyle focused on camping, which gave players a huge advantage over their opponents and made the whole gameplay experience horrible in the process for everyone involved. A less time-sensitive approach to encouraging variation is the style system, found in many Japanese games. Your playstyle is rated on this scale the window. by school grades in Japan, and just like rhythm game difficulty options, they are plagued by inflation, going past A+, into S and SS territories, including S. Now, just like rhythm games and that concept of performative play I talked about before, these style grades can act as a guidance towards more exotic playstyles as well as an endgame for hardcore players. I was very disappointed to find out that, due to a fear of not being accessible enough, the developers of Devil May Cry 5 locked the best way the game was originally intended to be played behind one of the hardest difficulties. It's interesting because the approach that we took for Son of Sparta as a difficulty was that Right. What does this that scene look like? Difficulty where people who looks are good like at the game this. That just doesn't sound right to me. But the topic of difficulty in games is a very touchy one, that okay? so let's worry about that in that a future fine. video. Going back to Ultra Kill, the developer, RC Patala, implemented a style system all about positive reinforcement. In yeah. his words, the style meter does most of the heavy lifting in making the player expand their playstyle by giving them constant positive reinforcement when doing the right thing. It's implemented in such a I way think... that you can perform any of the pre-programmed stylish actions in order to increase your style grade like launching and killing an enemy in midair or shooting an enemy filled with nails using the electric rail cannon. Just imagine how it would look to get both of those at the same time. And on top of that, the game also checks how much time you spend in the air without touching the ground, as well as how long has it been since you switched weapons, among other invisible nope, variables. No, Rome wasn't built in a grade. day. Oh, and you want an A plus example of a stylish mechanic? Implement a coin in your game that you can flip up in the air. It doesn't do anything, so let the player. Yeah, Rome wasn't built for. in a day. Later I think I am. Hint at a potential fine. combo and allow the player to figure out that you can fling up the coin and shoot it in midair, only to have the bullet bounce into a nearby enemy, killing so them this instantly is the mock -up. and giving you mad style points. At that moment, an entire cluster of emergent combos light up in the player's head. Could I maybe use the real cannon on this? And no, that it's is time to separate fuck. all of these layers. This is an interesting approach of presenting the player you with a curated move list that don't know allows how for emerging stylish fun zone behaviors. It's just risky to assume actually. that players will willingly adopt those playstyles. For example, this is how I played Dishonor, one of my all-time favorite games. Yeah. I chose the non-lethal ghost approach of sneaking everywhere and as soon as a guard saw me, I had to quick load from the last checkpoint. It was fun, like this. but it wasn't this fun. You're looking at gameplay footage from someone on YouTube much more skilled and creative than me. Now, those were a handful of examples I am personally familiar with when it comes to encouraging versus enforcing playstyles. And I'm aware enforcing a playstyle oh, is but... generally considered to be a no-no. But I'm curious why. Because when it works, it works. I mean, can we have a discussion about your thoughts on this whole fun zone concept in the comments? Because I would honestly absolutely love that. So or this if you is the to know any other example that fit on older this spectrum, for the stage. Please let me know. I'm constantly going 
Sounds bright and reading comments from previous videos to add to my personal notes on those topics. Okay, zero. I would like to leave you with an eye-opening piece of advice I got Who's when I started dick off bag. making games. Someone asked me, who are you making your game for? If it's for the players, then you have to take their feedback into account. And if you listen to everyone and allow a large group of people dictate what goes in your game, you'll probably end up with a grey goop of a game, lacking any personality. And that approach of trying to please everyone is fine, but probably not the best. On the other hand, if you're making the game for yourself, then you are in charge of that game's direction. If you're doing things right, that's how you get people to appreciate your work Bitch and bag. build a Three. following. Sure, you're going to put off some players in the process and maybe even cause a backlash. You cannot make everybody happy. And in the bag end, that's four. the risk of sticking to your vision. The vision of making the players feel what you want them to feel. This one's kind of small. Play that way, we kill them. So I started getting this one kind of feels like it's upside and down. So far, I have declined around nine thousand dollars worth of deals. I'm not sure if this is the right decision in the long run, but it feels like the right thing to do right now. So please help me offset that big gap in my wallet by supporting this channel um, on Patreon. Eight. Even though I'm the voice you hear, there are some awesome people helping me with editing and backend management, Nine. and I'm not letting them work for free. So running this channel gets expensive really fast. Link is in this the description. This should just and be the, the regular discounted game. Fresh you get game. to see these the videos before one. they go public, access to a hidden private Discord channel, and I'm even thinking about making and sending some merch goodies to all the patrons in the near yeah. future. No promises though. More on that later. Until then, thanks for watching. That was the tipped over. This is the regular garbage. And okay. That's patio. Size, let's increase this to four hundred by four. Uh, uh. Uh, excuse me. Uh, 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 uh. 100 patio look at that i don't know if i should give it an outline i'm since it's a background element i'm kind of leaning towards not giving it an outline i don't like decisions decisions always need to make decisions patio.png Patio, uh, grounds, whatever. Worry about the ground later. Door. 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 Going to ignore that. <laughs> Pretend that bottom portion doesn't exist. Okay, let's try to get this baby symmetrical. Width is 140. Okay, so now it should be symmetrical. I think? No. Well, this should be better. Check. One, two, three, four. Okay, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Two, stream. Three, where four. I will be using the 3.5 simulation. Oh, jeez. She scared me. Cool effects. Wait, let me try to find another uh, video. Oh, this game controls your heartbeat. I haven't watched this before. Set the perfect mood for this game. It looks like it came out on the PS1 and it plays like modern Doom. So how can this one level arena shooter be one of the best designed games I have ever played? Door.
developed by Sorath and released in 2016, Devil Daggers is an emotional roller coaster for me. It's a pretty obscure game, and the developing team shares some DNA with Dust Force. However, just like the game itself, they are shrouded in mystery, with very little online presence as they prefer to keep the focus on the game rather than on themselves. Naturally, that only made me more curious, and after enough digging, I'm happy to say that I managed to get on an actual call with one of the developers. But they wish to remain anonymous, so I won't be using any clips from our call. So, Devil Daggers is the kind of game that oozes style from every aspect of it. It's the kind of game where the lowest FOV is 85. The gameplay is super simple. You're thrown in an arena and you're asked to survive for as long as you can as the game keeps throwing enemies your way. Once you die, submit score to leaderboard and notice that your friends are better than you, like this specific friend of mine called Surf Shark VPN. And it just so happens to be the sponsor of this <laughs> video. Now, if you Surf Shark VPN. So even though that was bad, that was bad, that was a really bad shooter, transition. Gameplay is not actually about aiming accuracy, but instead it's a game about strategy and prioritizing targets. I was told that the core thesis of the game was to make the player feel like they're always on the edge of being overwhelmed. Now, even though it's a simple gameplay loop, it has heaps of depth to its mechanics, and I want to highlight a very cool thing I noticed about this game. Every single element in Devil Daggers is designed with intent. intent. From the art style to mechanics, enemies, level design, and even the audio, every component in the game has a well thought out purpose. The developer said that he likes to go back to old Game Boy games because there are so few buttons on that system and there's a lot to be learned from that. So he was really inspired by that minimalism and subtlety, you know, less is more. So the arena, enemies, and guns would be considered to be the core elements of the Ooh, game. Or and yet, they're very simple in nature. I noticed that in a lot of cases, the first and worst go-to solution Column. to make a game feel better than it is, yet. is to add power-ups and unnecessary complexity. And that's a very easy trap to fall into without actually benefiting the gameplay. But Devil Daggers very carefully avoided that trap. The arena, for example, it's a simple circle, and that's it. There are no other levels or shapes, and it never changes because it doesn't have to. It would have been very tempting to make these square tiles go up and down. Uh, oh, the gems, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think it would make the game better. Same thing goes for the weapons. A similar game might feel the need to add multiple weapons that you can switch between with the need to reload, but not in this game. There are no weapon pickups and no reloading necessary. You only have your left mouse button to fire. Tap it once for a shotgun blast or hold it down for a continuous spray. And those two types of using the same kind of weapon were thought out in such a way to be complemented by the enemy behavior, Gen which two. just like the other elements has proper intent behind Behind it. I was told that weapons are as good as the enemy design. So let's talk about those flying skulls. Gem three. Compared to other games, there are very few a enemy chunker. variations in Devil Daggers. You're a chunker, aren't you? I don't like that. Specific. And after sampling some high scores from the leaderboard, I managed to calculate that a majority of players only see four enemies in their playthrough. I was able to figure that out because as the in-game timer ticks up, enemies spawn in a specific order at a specific timestamp. Their spawn location is randomized, but the timing is the same for all players in order to keep the leaderboards relevant. When you start a game, the first thing you see is a squid tower in the distance, three. slowly and very creepily. Oof, okay. Full of okay. Sprites, sprites, sprites. sprites. The small boys are always follow you done, I think. Alright, time to move on. They are pretty much the first and weakest enemy in the game, but they introduce you to the concept of prioritizing enemies. Prioritizing enemies. Right away is easy. There's not that many of them, but if you leave them unattended for a while, they quickly add up and find I should. a big skull cloud, reinforcing the decision. I should try to find some resources on game design for my game. For a 2D action platformer, that is. Then there's the centipede. 
it looks awesome and its underside is covered in red gems. More on those later. It moves in a sine wave pattern, which means that if you time it just right, you can get under it and perform a very satisfying thing known as a centipede scrape. Later on, a beefed up version of the centipede shows up that actually challenges your movement and positioning, but I'll let you get to that point yourself. And in the meantime, there is one more enemy I'd like to talk about. This fucking spider right here. It's introduced at the same time as the first centipede this shows spider. up, which is done on purpose, and if there we you go. want to deal with it quick... Ooh, now we're in game, baby. More assets. What the heck? That wasn't supposed to happen. I just, yeah, seriously, what happened? I wasn't paying attention. Okay, so apparently the ground isn't working. I don't know what happened there. It was working before. It was definitely working before. But now it's not. <laughs> so what gives? Is look. look the white box here. Yeah, there's supposed to be collision there. Oh, unless there isn't. Unless I forgot to put the collision on the on the inside. Yes. No, 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 no. There is collision there. There is collision there, so something happened. It's not working. It ain't working, man. What? What? Okay, hold on. Let me, let me just make sure that everything else is working. Nope. Okay, okay. So I probably somehow screwed up collision somehow. When did that happen? That, do I need to restart the project? I mean, I did put in a bunch of new assets. Maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe it's struggling because of the guilt. Because I'm streaming at the same time. This is the first time I've streamed Game Engine 2. No, no, okay, okay, what gives, what gives? What gives, why are my four collisions not working anymore? Does the debugger have anything to say about it? Nope. Uh, I don't know. So I think collisions are based off of the tile set. 
Physics layer tile set physics layers. Collision layers. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It looks it looks fine to me. Collision. So okay, what if I put on the that layer there? Nope. That didn't work. I'm just going to leave it alone. Why? Why oh why? Why oh why oh why? Aren't my collisions working? What? Did the collisions on the tile map get reset? Is that what happened? Yeah, that's what it... Or did that happen? What? 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 How did that happen? Why did that happen? Yeah, all of the... What the fuck? Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. I mean, it's fine. Uh, it looks like I fixed it. Why did that happen? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to stash all of these changes. Yeah. Reload. Everything. White box. What the hell? Alright. Something very funky happened. Yeah, that's why that's what I thought. Da 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 da, pong pong pong. Okay, it's fine. All I need to do is fix the tile set. Yeah. 
Yep. And these are one ways, yeah. One ways. Okay, that's... I think that's it. That's all I needed to do. Let's give it a test. Yeah. Yep. Works. That's great, great. Okay, disable the white box. I'm going to push all of these changes. Sprites. In 2D scene tutorial stage tutorial this stage you know what I'm not going to make it from scratch okay that is not something I'm willing to do Tutorial stage cutscene. Cartesian. Move that to the correct folder. Now we have this. This baby. Skybox, it's going to be very red. I can get rid of these, these background elements, so that all that's left is this cavern. BG. Aren't I supposed to be able to see it? Yeah, what gives? Why can't I see it? Visible module I can yeah. Yeah, yeah, where so where is it? Oh, it's just problem with it. View view preview canvas scale. There it is. There it is. Yes. It's going to look something like that. Entry point, exit points. Layout. Visual. I'm going to clear everything. Any of this anymore. Same with the white box, the background jump. Get rid of everything. I said get rid of it! Die! What? 
There you go, it took me a while. Okay. Okay, so... Do something like this. This is just going to be a good old regular rectangle. No way in or out. I can modify later. Characters. Don't need any of that. I'll just get rid of the foreground for now. Now, props. Props. Sprite 2D. Going to have a building. So this is it. So we're next to a cafeteria. This is a cafeteria building. Cafeteria base. So actually what I'm going to do Cafeteria. I'm going to make it its own scene. Say branch of scene. Assets. Stages. Try to find the right spot. Props. Cafeteria. Cafeteria. So this is the base. Why is it? Why is it so offset? Okay. That's a little odd. Sprite. It's gonna have some of these spiral columns. Duplicate that. Yeah, it looks a little funky. I don't really care. Right. Okay. Flip it horizontally, there it is. Offset. Okay, so these are the, the columns. A sprite 2D replace with spiral column. A roof ornament. Like so. No, 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 I said duplicate. Duplicate, please. Oh my, yeah, now we're talking. Looks delightfully devilish. Gem. And we can adorn it with some gems. Them behind. Oh, behind the base too. Gems, gems, gems. Gems. I'm just do a lot of these copy and paste things. Sure. Needs a door. That's the main. Main door to get in. One to get out. On the other side, there's no self-respecting cafeteria, only has one of them. Should I do anything about... Okay, what if... T 
turn this 90 degrees and use this as like a filler center or for this spot. Meh. A uh, couple windows. I don't, I didn't like how that looked. So a couple windows. Window, window. You know, gotta let the sunlight in. <laughs> what little sunlight there is. These aren't roof ornaments, they are those. Roof ornament to window. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the cafeteria building, alright. Yeah, I think I can do it one better. Cafeteria base. So this is the cafeteria base. And this can be the actual cafeteria. Cafeteria. You name this cafeteria base. You'll see what I'm talking about. See what I'm talking about later. I completely fucked up this stage, but that's fine. So here's a cafeteria base, that's one, this is two! Check this out. Awesome. do it by one ability scale this okay so this gives it little variation little asymm asymmetry you will Uh, you know, it looks kind of bad, but honestly, I don't really care about that. It's good enough. Let me just put a glider here for background. It is part of the background. It's not a regular prop. A tile map. White box. Yeah, there's the white box there. Yes. Yes, that's good. That's good. Fade in out. It's there. I think alpha I want it to go to is 42. It's out. Yeah. All right. Okay. 
cafeteria. Then the props. Put this up here. Only really one spot. Here. Tutorial stage. Page two. Stage. I call it a stage. Tutorial stage cutscene copy path there. Let's see what it looks like. Oh, that's awesome. That's pretty good. Yeah. Let me just adjust the camera. These are the limits of the camera. Move the background so I can actually see it. A good uh, no, it's not okay. Two, I still might not be able to see it, but uh, who cares? Yep, okay, that's looking pretty good. If I do say so myself, for now, I can use this as a holder. You know, it's it's going to be going to be quite dark, quite dark in here. Okay, maybe this is too dark. Too, too dark, too red. Hold on a second, this is not supposed to be shaded. Yeah, it looks like this instead. A bit more pink. Yep, okay. Props, uh, I need to set up more props, so this is going to be the patio. Let's 
sprite patio patio So notice how I can mix and match these assets together, form cool combination. Like that, yeah. Mm. Mm. So right now, I think, whoops, I didn't want to change the canvas module, I wanted to change the skybox color. Not dark enough. That should be better. No, that's more of a cavern feel. Cavern feel. And actually, what I want to do This is going to be a little wacky I need to put another sprite too over there I'm going to look for Here it is. See it? Yeah. So let me increase the scale of the four. Transform one point five. It's not enough cover. Mm. 
2.1. Oh, we're getting there. Three. Right. So I'm going to mask it. Result should be a pretty cool effect. If we were actually able to see it. What if I just moved it? Just moved it over. What? Preview canvas scale. We should be able to see it. I should see it. Where is it? Where'd you go? Let me adjust some settings. Okay, clip only. Yep, that. Distributes. Moving. 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 Oh, Ooh, okay, there we go. And yeah, now we're seeing some stuff. Now we're seeing action. That just stays there. Okay. That might actually make it a little easier. Twelve eighty divided by two. Seven twenty divided by two. Okay, look at that. This gives the impression that you're in a cavern, hopefully. That's the sort of impression I want to give. And in the distance, you can see the sea. You can see the sea. Looks a little odd. Might be a bit too. Over, little, left, to the left, to now it should be seamless. That looks pretty cool, don't you think? Okay, so setting, you're in a cave. But, you can see, see out the back. So, light, light. So what if I put a light there? It's kind of funny. <laughs> okay, what I'll do... I'll make a light. Put a light. Wrecked. Light. 
a white square here, four by four white square. I drastically increase. So it's lit up kind of like this. If unlink this, this can be, I don't know, 10. That will result in something that looks a little like this. Yeah. Color, it's a little bit blue. Energy, it definitely does have to be that energetic. Yeah, I don't even think it should look like that. Cylinder. Yeah, I think this looks a lot better. Uh, gradient. Gradual light. Yep, okay. Cool. Uh, put on some torches too. So I do have some torch. Torches. Yeah, look at this! Now we're playing with fire. Yeah, directly underneath the patio. <laughs> He's right next to it. Lots of lights. Lights for everyone. Damn, that is bright. So I think the the light on these torches probably a bit too strong, if I'm being honest. Oh, and why is the cafeteria floating? It shouldn't be floating. Yeah, it, it looks a little, looks a little bit weird, but you know, it's just work in progress. Work in progress. All right. Um, what is this? So what? This mine is fifty-five. What the heck did I put? Oh. Oh, right. Okay. Minus... Minus 10. So this will be in the background. Visual. Visual. Ooh. Look at that. 
stuff in the background and put another building there. A second cafeteria. But smaller. And stackier. Will give the the room like a sense of depth. Minus ten. Follow viewport scale. Zero point six. Zero point six. Why not zero? Nah. Zero point three. About that. Why is it so big? <laughs> because the scale is all s it's all screwed up. Zero point seven. Okay, that should make it look a little bit better. Yeah? Uh, you can wall jump on the cafeteria, that's not... It's not intended. I need to get rid of this. Cafeteria. Base. Just a base. And... Transform! Zero point five, zero point five. I'm really just kind of messing around, seeing what looks cool, what doesn't. I think this looks pretty neat. Pretty neat, yeah. Zero point nine. So it's right there in the foreground. Minus eleven. All of you. Or 0 0.7 background, just a little. Take it out, move it over. Yeah. This is how you work with layers, baby. I think I might have gone a little bit overboard with this one. 0 0.3, this needs to be like way off in the background. Look at that, look at this sense of depth. I think this is probably a bit too close to us though. This is too low on the ground. Let's check it out. Yeah, that's that's pretty sick. It's pretty sick. Just need to add more background, uh, uh, more buildings. It's 
So I, I think... I think having a three-layered... Three background layers should be good enough. So I'm going to put one more. Minus 12 here. Minus 12, follow viewport. 0 0.2, so what is this? What's minus 10? 0 0.5? 0 0.3. I'll have that be 0 0.3. This can be 0 0.4, so you... You have been promoted. It looks so cool. This skin hide like just off. Off, that's fine. Shy. Yeah, now, now it's looking like a, a complex of buildings. Yeah. You can reuse the assets. Clever ways you can come up with stuff that looks like this. I'm pretty happy. This place still looks pretty, um, pretty drab. Like, it's very red. <laughs> it's super red. And out here, it's like, kind of normally lit. There's like, like the sky off in the background. Really gives off the impression that we live in a cave, which is... Yes, this is in a cave. So yeah, um, I can come back here later to touch up on some stuff. I think for a rush job that I did in two hours, it looks pretty good. <sighs> Ugh. But what this is actually for should have said that at the start. Uh, that's what I was alluding to at the start. Is that this is... actually... the tutorial stage, so... When you start a, a new game, it's going to go here. Let me try to... try to show that. Okay, so that's a bug where the... The music gets kind of screwed up if you go back to the main menu. I'll get around to fixing it. For right now, it sounds kind of cool. Yeah, so it's going to go here, it's going to play a cutscene. Cutscene, so let's set up the cutscene. Cutscene. Tutorial cutscene zero one. 
That's its name. Tutorial Cutscene 01. So all of my cutscenes need an animation player. It's going to have a cutscene character animator. Actor name is the player. Music stop trigger. Okay. Start. Music stops. So when the cutscene starts, I don't want there to be music. It's going to be empty, finished. Music. Music trigger. Going to play a song. Song when it finishes. Trigger. So finished and start character cutscene. Good. Yeah. Then the trigger for this is going to be an area 2 2D that collides with the player's trigger, which is on layer 4 if I remember correctly. Yep. If I just put a gigantic... yeah, like this. So it's going to hit this, area 2D, I set it up so that cutscenes have a start method that's going to start it. And what should happen is that it starts the cutscene like so, and that's, yeah, yeah. Page entry. There is a problem. Just for disable, disable. This should be yes. just disable. Okay, that should fix that error message. I'll get around to fixing all of these error messages in the debugger eventually. I swear I'll do it. Eventually. Eventually. Okay, hold on. Let, let me just move it over. There we go. That's what's supposed to look like. <laughs> That's what it's supposed to look like. Okay, we're going to have a camera, camera there. When it's, it finishes, it's going to end its priority, but when it starts, it's going to set its priority to 10. Zoom 3. I don't know if I'm going to update the zoom. This camera will be here. Oh, it's pretty bad. Mission zero. Yep, uh, yeah, that that's more like it. That is more like it.
So this is kind of going to be what it's going to look like. So, cutscene is going to start off character. Going to walk a little bit to the right. Stand two seconds of walking, then going to stand there for a little bit. Position so when this cutscene is done, it's going to end. Yeah, I don't think I needed to. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Um, when this cutscene starts, I want to disable its trigger. Like that. So that's kind of going to be the first shot of the game. The audio screen player. I also want to play a sound effect there. So let me try to find a sound effect. Hunger. I hunger. Yeah, that that's, uh, sounds kind of weird, but yeah. Stomach growl. Growl, so that is a new sound effect. I'm going to put that somewhere. Alright, check this out. Stomach growl dot way off. Disgusting. Okay, so I'm going to put that underneath the Victor animator. Audio stream player 2D. This is the the hunger SFX. Uh, bus goes to sound effects, of course. Oh. I'm trying to find another song. Uh, 
Hmm. Uh, this will do for a placeholder, I guess. Maybe this song. like this song to be honest. And I can say that because I made it. found out that this wasn't looping, and so that is ambience that's supposed to be looping. Yeah, something like that. Might be dialogue, I don't know if I'm going to put dialogue there. Actually, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna make another animator. So to differentiate them, this is going to be the player animator. This is going to be NPC one. NPC one. Characters. I'm going to put a placeholder NPC here. NPC 1. NPC 2. C 2. Yeah, yeah, okay. And an NPC too, like that. Okay, so start. So let's increase the length of this. So she's like, oh, I'm really hungry. Then some students walk by her. That's going to be the NPC. Gonna be walking. Walking. Yeah, let's say that it takes them like twenty entire seconds to walk over. I mean that's probably too much. Probably. Might not be. Who knows? For the time being, I'm going to get rid of this wall. 
Good to get rid of it here. It's just in the way. The animators. The NPCs. <laughs> okay, so that wasn't supposed to happen. Here they just kind of stand around. NPC one, um, you shouldn't be moving, like, at all. Hello? Okay. Why? Okay, you know what? It doesn't matter. It literally does not matter. We'll make an NPC. The NPC is going to be an N like that. And this one actually. Okay, so the character that I copied this over from. Is supposed to have gravity. Just sets it so that it has gravity. Visuals, so this is the name of the character. Put put everything in here. Like that. Hopefully it doesn't screw anything up. I don't think it should though. Let me just check. Oh, I did not like that. That at all. Ugh. Great. Ugh.
So I need to do some, uh, okay, that's fine. I need to do some serious refactoring on this case. This character script because it's getting a little too. That's fine. All I need to do is extract the visuals from this character and put it somewhere else. That's, that's it. Now I can back. Get rid of this node. All of these out. Rid of this node. So now the NPC has the same visuals as my player character. But that's fine because I have a special technique called changing their color. The primary color. Yeah, now they're red instead of pink. Okay, I am also also going to disable their collider. They are not going to have any input. They're just going to be on no input. No fancy states. Yeah, this looks good to me. So instead of um, NPCs, they use the actual NPC character. C1, NPC2. Uh oh. Looks like I broke something. Yeah. Why would it do that? Let me check uh, another one. What? What is? Visuals. I know, but when I did that, it fucked everything up. Oh my god. Uh, well, I'm not fucking going back and redoing everything, so that's out of the question. I'm just going to guard all those changes. That's out of the fucking question. What? Let me reload it. Wasn't supposed to change it. Just put it like that.
Okay, there we go. I think it should be fixed. That was a little scary. <laughs> but they're broken. <laughs> NPCs are broken. Why is that? That should fix it, right? Yeah, it should fix it. But hello. It's not working. Why isn't it working? I did this. Root node. Node 2. Local. Back to vision. So the nodes. Over, it's going to start complaining. Doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about now. But if I move it, to visuals after I do better. No two D. Great, so that's working. Okay, okay, now, now we're thinking. Now we're thinking with cutscenes. Yeah, look at them go! What else? Uh, I'll think about it later. I'm getting pretty tired. Alright, that's the stream. Bye. <laughs>